So you wait 20 years for a Booker Prize, and then two come along at once. That was the opening line to Mantel's Booker Prize acceptance speech in 2012. And as Livy quite rightly pointed out, this was an unprecedented literary achievement. The only person to have won the Booker Prize twice before is J.M. Kurtzia, who is one of the kind of major names of contemporary writing. It was unprecedented because a sequel has never won the award before. On top of that, a woman has never won the award twice. And also on top of that, no British writer has ever won the award twice. So it kind of catapulted Mantel from fame to, you know, stratospheric fame. You know, she went massive overnight. And she was on all of the front covers of all of the newspapers in this country. Um, so if you want a role model as a writer, you could go far wrong, you know, sort of selecting Mantel. Very, very successful. Livy's already introduced me as somebody who's done a PhD on Mantel's writing. But what's particularly interesting for me is that exactly this time last year, I was in my viva, uh, literally at, at, this, at this time last year, at 10 minutes past two, a year ago, I was defending my thesis. Uh, so this lecture is particularly pertinent to me. This is my anniversary, so I'm celebrating it by talking to you all about Hilary Mantel. I've not forgotten about her just yet. What I want to do today is use some of my knowledge of Mantel's writing to try and inform your creative practice. So you're all on this unit because you want to learn about writing in genres. And I know that you've been looking at lots of different genres over the course of this unit. Obviously, today we'll be thinking about historical fiction. OK. So if you have a look on your handout, the first quotation that I put on there is from um, a culture show interview that Mantel did uh, before she won the Booker Prize for the second time. Sorry, could I have your attention at the back, please? Um, I'm looking at the handout, so you should be facing forward and, and listening. OK, the first quotation is, it's very much the way I view the world. I don't trust it tremendously. I always feel that if I put my hand on the wall, my hand might go through it. I think as a child, you see, I was always listening hard. I was always trying to get some purchase on what was going on and work out what was happening in the next room. You really do need to know for your own self-preservation whether the devil is behind that door. I've included this quotation because it sums up a lot about Mantel's writing. This is somebody who focuses on ambiguity and also on the fact that we never can be sure that we know what is going on or what is going to happen next. And a lot of this is, is kind of grounded in her own biography. I won't go into that today. Um, but this idea of needing to find out what's going on behind the door is something that she has experienced all her life. Mantel remains a critically invisible writer, so despite the fact that she's hugely famous, there's very little written about her. And yet her writing is pervaded by this kind of ambiguity and uncertainty, uh, which to me seems so full of possibility. For those of you who have read Wolf Hall, you'll know that Cromwell does actually break down a door in that novel in order to find out what is happening on the other side of it. By the time we get to bring up the bodies, he's too old for that. You know, he's too old to go breaking down doors all of his life. He has to intuit what is beyond the door. So this kind of process mimics something in Mantel's work generally. As you'll see over the page, I've included my footnotes like a good student. I've included these on here because these are all MHRA referenced. So if you're having any problems with your MHRA referencing, this could be a good guide, just a kind of quick crib on how to footnote books. And also you've got on there <clears throat> an article from a newspaper. Um, so all of that is like along the lines of MHRA. So if you need to uh, kind of gem upon that, then it's on the back. You'll also probably know that Bring Up the Bodies forms the second of a trilogy of books. Uh, we know that the title of the final book is going to be called The Mirror and the Light. Um, and we also know that it's going to end with the um, opening line from Wolf Hall. Apart from that, we don't know anything else about it. The fact that Bring Up the Bodies exists as a book at all is quite contentious. Um, and if you want to know more about that, then do, do please ask me. 
Because this is my specialism, I could talk to you for a very long time about it. So I'm going to try and keep it brief um, and keep it to um, what's going to be relevant to you as writers. For those of you who've been in lectures with me before, there's one person who was in a lecture with me this morning, um, poor man. Um, I talk in 15-minute chunks and then I give you an activity to make sure that you're all still on the same page as me and that you're all learning. Okay, so 15 minutes is generally how long a person can concentrate for without a break. And then after that, you will be expected to do an exercise. Okay, so as you'll see from the uh, Prezi presentation behind me, there are kind of four key areas that I'm going to go over with you today. Um, And after each one of those, we'll do a kind of recap exercise. Okay, so I'm talking about Bring Up the Bodies, as you know, 2012. The first thing that I want to talk to you about, of course, is Mantell herself as a writer. Um, So she was born in 1952, and she's still alive. Um, She's British, and she's a writer of historical and contemporary fiction. People have found her very difficult to categorise, because she does different things in different books. She's famous, as you know, for these historical novels set in the Tudor period, focusing on Thomas Cromwell. She's also written short stories and plays, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, subsequently. Mantell is a prolific journalist and the recipient of many awards. On top of the Booker Prize, she's also won the Costa. She's won the David Cohen, which is the equivalent of the British Nobel. So you've heard of the Nobel Peace Prize, the Nobel Prize for Literature. She's won the David Cohen, and this is a recognition of her life's work. She was also recently made a Dane. So when she comes, she's actually Dane Hilary Mantel, um, if that matters to you. Okay, so I've put some information up on this slide about her. Uh, She was born in Hadfield in Derbyshire, uh, which is actually only 15 miles away from Manchester. And I know this because I'm from Hadfield as well. Um, She was born Hilary Mary Thompson. And as I've said, she's the author of 11 novels, two collections of short stories, and one memoir, Giving Up the Ghost. Um, And at this point, I want to draw your attention to the second quotation on the handout underneath the heading Hilary Mantel, which says, I purvey my own version of events, but facts change according to your viewpoint. I think this is something really important to consider when reading Mantel, that her view of history is something fluid, you know, so depending on where you're standing, your perspective will change how you understand history. So she doesn't see history as a clear, solid thing. She sees it as subjective and based upon your position. Um, this is why I think it's interesting that she's written a memoir, because she does that very explicitly there in 2003. Um, to kind of give you a bit of hope in terms of being a practicing and professional writer, She was writing from the 1970s, actually, even though we've only recently heard about her. And in 1979, her first novel, uh, A Place of Greater Safety, which is over 800 pages, was rejected from a publisher. Um, It was ultimately published in 1992, (coughs) but she had a major setback, obviously, in that year, 1979, of thinking, is this right for me? Um, So this is someone, as I've said, who's gone on to be incredibly famous. So being a writer is is full of these points in the journey. During this period, she was described as, quote, curiously invisible, end quote, by a woman called Anna Vaux. Um, This wasn't uncommon in terms of the way that Mantel was approached in reviews um, and in the, the kind of scant literary criticism. She hadn't got the recognition that she really deserved. This has been massively reversed uh, by the winning of the Booker Prizes, but on top of that, she has um, attracted an awful lot of unpleasant uh, reportage in the tabloid press. Um, So in uh, recent times, she wrote uh, an article called Royal Bodies, and she also presented this at the British Library. The article came out in the London Review of Books, um, and it was really an analysis of the way that we present our royal family. You know, so we present them in a particular kind of way, we frame them in a particular way, and we have expectations of them that are unreasonable. Um, this prompted the Daily Mail to attack Mantel, um, and they put on the front um, of their newspaper that she'd said, uh, the Duchess of Cambridge was a plastic princess designed to breed, um, which was 
rather taken out of context, but it, it generated a huge storm in a teacup, which culminated with David Cameron saying that she was absolutely wrong about what she'd said, um, and then shortly after admitting that he hadn't actually read the article in question, but that didn't make any difference at all. So she's, she's generated a lot of unpleasant um, media coverage, and this is, this is kind of ongoing. Um, I don't know if any of you will have heard of her collection, The Assassination of Margaret Thatcher, but this came out recently, and the title story, The Assassination of Margaret Thatcher, caused an awful lot of uh, Tory MPs and peers to kind of come out on Twitter and basically say that she should be arrested um, and probably charged with treason. Um, so she is very famous, but she also kind of has, has been seen to court um, a lot of media attention. Okay, so if you look at the third quotation on your handout, this is also from Mantel, um, and this is where she talks most explicitly about her view on history. And she says, the thing that frightens me most is the confiscation of history. If you don't own the past, you can't speak up for it. Your past can be stolen and falsified. It can be changed behind you. The Tudor trilogy actually started life really in an earlier book called Beyond Black, which was the first time that Mantell had achieved great sales. This is in 2005. Um, and it's a book that's about Alison Hart, who is a medium, practicing medium. Um, and in the book, you know, she really is a medium. She really does talk to the dead. She really is surrounded by ghosts. Um, and when I met Mantell a couple of years ago, she said it was nothing but, quote, a vast preparatory project for the Tudor books, end quote. So her exploration of this medium figure was actually a preparation for her writing about the Tudors. And this seems an interesting way to think about writing historical fiction, because Mantell is positioning herself as the medium here, the person who can talk to the dead, who can bring them to life, who can communicate with them. It's thinking about how much is the story your own creation, and how much are you a conduit for something that has already happened. So this might be something you want to think about in terms of your own writing. If you want to write about history, these stories already exist. So what are you offering? Where are you in all of that? Sorry, can I just ask, what was the name of that book again? Which book? Beyond Black? Yeah. Yeah, Beyond Black, 2005. Um, as well as the Tudor books, she also wrote A Place of Greater Safety, which I've put up on here, which is actually um, a kind of study of the French Revolution. So that's a definite historical uh, novel as well. Um, and it kind of goes into the characters um, and it offers an alternative view. You know, so she's already, I've already quoted her saying that she pervades her own version of events. Um, in a place of greater safety, Robespierre, who is considered to be a, a, the huge tyrant of the French Revolution, is presented as, as pretty nice, actually. Quite a nice guy, a bit troubled um, and a bit unsure of himself. So she, she puts something human back into history. Okay, so I've already talked to you for 20 minutes, actually. Um, and what I would like you to do now is just spend a minute answering this question. On the basis of what I've already said to you, what frightens Mantel most? Is it A, the consummation of history, or B, the conservation of history, or finally C, the confiscation of history? So just a minute, starting now. Focusing on the question rather than talking. Okay, so you've had a minute. Which of those answers was it? Was it consummation, was it conservation, or was it confiscation? Confiscation. It was confiscation, absolutely. What does that mean? What does the confiscation of history mean? Absolutely. 
and using it for your own purposes, snatching it and making it say what you want it to say. So that's something that you probably will do as writers, but it's also something that tyrants do, it's something that nations do. Um, confiscation of history is something that's quite frightening. Okay, the next thing that I'm going to talk to you about then is the Tudor court. Um, and I've got a slide here for you about the Tudor court. Um, I'm not sure how much you already know about the Tudors, um, but I've put up a, a kind of um, a sort of crib about uh, the, Tudor, the Tudor court under Henry VIII. So Henry VIII, um, he didn't reign actually from 1491. He lived from 1491 to uh, 1547. Um, I'm assuming that all of you will have heard of Henry VIII. Can you put your hand up if you haven't heard of Henry VIII? So how many wives did Henry VIII have? Six. And what happened to them? Does anyone know the rhyme? The horse the head and dies, the horse the head survives. Absolutely, yeah. That sounded a bit like a school classroom for a minute there. <laughs> okay, yes, um, he had six wives, and you're absolutely right, they all met different fates, um, apart from two, obviously, that were actually beheaded. Um, but what I want to talk to you about first is Catherine of Aragon, who was um, Henry VIII's first wife, um, and also his brother Arthur's widow. So before Henry VIII uh, became king, his brother was on the throne, um, and she, he was married to Catherine of Aragon, um, and he died very young. Um, and that meant that, quite suddenly, Henry VIII had to take on the crown and was rather hurriedly married to his brother's widow. Um, and this caused quite a lot of problems later on. Um, Catherine of Aragon actually gave birth five times, but she only had one child survive, and that child was Mary, and became Mary the First, Bloody Mary. Does anybody know why she was called Bloody Mary? She did loads. She killed loads of people. Uh, yeah, she burnt a lot of Protestants or heretics, uh, because she was a Catholic ruler, and she was trying to draw the country back to Catholicism. Um, she was, not, she was fighting a losing battle because of what Henry VIII had done in terms of allowing um, power to move from Rome back to England. So he became the head of his own church and he didn't need the Pope anymore. Um, and this, this changed English history. Okay. However, the Tudor dynasty was something that was quite new, um, beginning with uh, Henry's father, Henry VII. Um, and... The history of this period is really the history of the uncertainty of a woman's womb. Because all the time, Henry VIII is thinking about his heir, his male heir. He needs a son. Um, and this is something that just doesn't seem to happen for him, to say the least. So by 1527, uh, Catherine of Aragon, his first wife, was past childbearing, childbearing age. Um, and this meant that... Uh, he was increasingly desperate. He was also kind of casting his eye around in terms of who he found attractive within his court, but he was desperate in terms of re requiring a male heir. Um, and this period has been described by Mark Lawson in reading Bringing Up the Bodies as a, quote, tragedy of fertility. This is on your handout as well. Um, and in his front row interview with Mantel in 2012, he talked about the womb um, and uh, considers it as the, the harbinger of uncertainty par excellence. Um, and Mantel talked about, quote, a woman's body, will it deliver, end quote. And really this kind of summarises the period. Um, all of it comes down to the kind of biology of, you know, first of all Catherine of Aragon and then later Anne Boleyn as to whether or not they can deliver this must-have thing for the king. Um, and... I think that it's quite interesting to think that English history turns on that, turns on something as crude as a woman's womb. In the article Royal Bodies, as well as apparently criticising the Duchess of Cambridge, um, Hilary Mantel also writes about Henry, and she writes about kind of biological theories of Henry. Um, it's becoming apparent that he may have had a blood type known as Kells positive. Um, and this rather changes our view of him um, because a lot of the kind of symptoms of um, having this blood type are uh, that your mood is affected, that you are impetuous, that you are uh, unfair. 
uh, hot-headed, etc. And he became increasingly like that through his life, which matches with this medical model. On top of that, being Kells positive means that it's very difficult for you to, um, to have a son. It's very, very difficult for you to do that. Um, and Henry VIII saw himself as cursed increasingly, that he'd made a bad decision with Catherine of Aragon, marrying his brother's widow, that was a bad move. And then he made a bad decision with Anne Boleyn, and he was cursed, you know, God had cursed him. Um, so this was his way of understanding it, whereas now we might read it more medically, which is, I think, quite important. Um, okay. So in terms of the court itself and why Mantell would want to write about it, um, I saw Mantell read in 2012 at the Southbank Centre in London, um, which was, it was just before she won the Booker Prize, um, and she talked a lot about the ambiguity of the Tudor court. Um, and I'm not sure how familiar you'll be with this, but um, the court is a kind of group of people that surround the monarch, and they're known as courtiers. And they're always trading, they're trading all the time, kind of secrets and knowledge, and they're trying to get close to the king or queen, and they're jostling all the time for favouritism. So it's a very intense environment. You know, it's like doing a creative writing degree, only more intense. You know, you're jostling all the time for recognition. Um, and not having that kind of recognition means you probably don't have as much money, you don't have as much status. So it, it's very cutthroat. Um, and as a result, it's very uncertain. And when Mantell talked about it, um, she was talking to, to James Nockerty, and he was saying that when she represents the court, um, we're being told to laugh at it all the time. When we're with Cromwell, and he's talking to ambassadors, for example, we're being prompted to laugh at the court. You know, the ambassadors are always poking fun at the king or... Uh, Anne Boleyn or whoever, and we're being prompted to laugh along with them. Um, and James Nockerty wanted her to explain that. And she described it as chortling. And she said that chortling is linked to this idea of the ambiguity of the Tudor court. Um, she said that the courtiers were people, quote, walking in the dark, end quote. And I think this is very much the case, even with people like Cromwell, who is powerful, he knows that really he could easily end up on the other end of an axe as a result of what Henry VIII is like. So all the time these people are walking in the dark, um, and it's a bit like kind of whistling in the dark, this idea of chortling. You know, if you don't laugh, you cry. Um, and it kind of lends itself to Mantell's writing because she does that in all of her books. Laughter and tragedy are always extremely close together, and she's always making you laugh at things that aren't very funny, things that are very dark, you know, um, and unpleasant you are made to laugh at um, so that's, that's the case in the, in the Tudor books um, so it's a product of ambiguity and she said in particular it was characterised by her by the writing of a poet called Thomas Wyatt um, could you put your hand up if you've heard of Thomas Wyatt okay so quite a few people here have which is good um, so I've put a picture of him on the handout. That isn't Hilary Mantel um, or Henry VIII. In fact, it's Thomas Wyatt, um, who was uh, a lyric poet from the period. Um, and Mantel read extensively into Wyatt's work um, and Wyatt's biography um, when she was writing the Tudor books because she felt that the way that he wrote about the court was something that she wanted to emulate um, and I've put a quotation on the handout from you, uh, which is from one of his poems, They Flee From Me. Um, and it's about this idea of a dream um, being something strange and, and kind of beyond your reach. Um, very famous poem, They Flee From Me. Um, so I've also put some information on there about Wyatt. Um, well, I haven't actually. I'm going to tell you some information that you can put on there about Wyatt. Uh, Wyatt lived between 1503 to 1542, and you might want to write this onto your handout. Um, and he was a close friend of Cromwell. Um, and Cromwell went out of his way to protect Wyatt. Um, one of the things that you may know about him is that it was, it was widely thought that he was either in love with Anne Boleyn or that he was having an affair with Anne Boleyn um, and that he had written poetry for Anne Boleyn. Um, and so when the scandal uh, begins to break, as we see in Bring Up the Bodies... Cromwell's move to protect Wyatt is something that actually happened. In order for Wyatt to escape being executed along with the other men, you know, Cromwell really had to work hard to keep him at a distance. 
So they were friends. Um, and this is evidenced in archives available that are, you know, sort of Cromwell's letters and diaries, etc. But also in um, Thomas Wyatt's own poetry, particularly the poem that begins, The pillar perished is whereto I lent. Um, this is written after Cromwell is executed. And I think Wyatt very much did see Cromwell as a pillar against which he could lean. Um, and he was devastated by his execution. Um, so Wyatt was English, England's finest poet at the time, lyric poet, but he was also a very close friend of Cromwell. Um, and therefore a very useful source for Mantell. She's really um, dug into Wyatt in order to write her novels. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you very quickly now um, about the plays um, which have been produced as, um, as a kind of result of the novels. Um, you probably didn't see um, on, the, on the kind of background to my slides, but on the uh, right-hand side, there was a figure, um, and that's actually Nathaniel Parker, who's an actor, and at the moment he is playing Henry VIII, uh, because Mantell's books, Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies, have been made into plays. Um, and the reason I want to talk to you about this is because I think it shows something about creative practice that you might want to think about yourselves. That books, novels, fiction, this kind of thing, it's a kind of straightforward process in which several people are involved, you know, in terms of editing, but then it's published and it's sent out. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of distributed um, and finalised to an extent. It's just with the reader then, you know, a singular individual experience. Whereas plays remain living. They're being tweaked all the time. And this is something I've learned from Mantell's work being made into plays. Um, and the plays themselves have been performed at um, the Swan in Stratford and then they transferred to London and now they've gone to Broadway. And every single time they've moved, they've changed. Um, so they were produced by the RSC and they've published their own copy um, of the play texts. So this is like the same text as a play. Um, but it's not the same as what was performed at Stratford, and it's not the same as what was performed at London, and now it's gone to America, it's being rewritten for an American audience, so they can't deal with the fact that the plays have got different titles, so it's not Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies, it's Wolf Hall Part 1 and 2. Um, so all the time, the text is being tweaked, and it's being adjusted by actors as well as writers, so it, be it becomes a living thing, which um, to me seems quite interesting. Uh, the plays themselves were adapted by uh, Mike Poulton, who I don't know, some of you may or may not have heard of. He's often worked with uh, long dead writers like Schiller, uh, but in this case he, he, decided to write, he decided to write alongside Mantell, and they worked in tandem. Um, I'm just going to read you a line from Bring Up the Bodies, the play version, um, which is towards the end um, in the final act. Um, and this will give you an idea that the play itself stays very true to form in terms of the novel. Um, so I've already talked to you about the Tudor court and its ambiguity. Um, and one of the lines that I think really sums this up is um, towards the end of the novel and obviously towards the end of the play. Um, it's where Thomas Cromwell is interrogating the men who've apparently slept with Anne Boleyn. Okay, so this is Norris and Weston um, and George Boleyn. Um, so he's interrogating them. Uh, and Norris says to him, you know what I meant. She's a married woman. A man's gear is no strange sight to her. And Cromwell replies, you know what you meant. I only know what you said. So all the time there is this appearance and then beneath that there's a sense of depth. And that's what happens in the court. The way courtiers present themselves isn't necessarily the way they actually feel or what they're actually going to do or any kind of representation of them as a person. Um, so it's a very, very uncertain environment, which seems to me alive with possibilities for writing. Okay, so that's the end of that section. I'd just like you to do, again, a short one-minute task now, which is to answer this question. Um, in fact, it's three questions, so you might want to write this down. So it's how many children did Henry's first wife, Catherine of Aragon, bear... So how many children did Catherine of Aragon bear? Who survived? And what became of them? Okay. Um, 
And there is a prize for anyone who can get all three of these answers right. So a minute on that starting now. No. <laughs> Okay, you've had a minute, so could you put your hand up if you think you've got the answer to all three of these questions? Um, okay, you had your hand up first, so what, what are the answers? Was it five? It was five. Um, Mary was five. Yeah, and anything else about Mary? Really Mary. Absolutely, okay. Do you like chocolate? I do. What is your name? Sophie. Okay, well you've won the whisper that I brought with me today. Um, yeah, so she, she, gave, she gave birth to five children... Um, you're going to have to break that off. Um, but yeah, none of them survived apart from Mary. And Mary's key flaw was that she was female, so she was useless. Um, and uh, yeah, she did go on to become monarch. Um, okay, so the next thing that I want to talk to you about then is character, which is particularly important for you as writers um, and um, might be something we are able to go in more detail to in the, in the seminars afterwards. Um, okay, so I've included a quotation on your handout, which is from Bring Up the Bodies, um, which is really about the relationship between Cromwell um, and Anne Boleyn. Um, and I've put some kind of characteristics on here about some of these key characters, uh, which I'll touch on in a moment. The quotation reads, He is not indifferent to women. So whenever it says he, this is always Cromwell. He is not indifferent to women. God knows, just indifferent to Anne Boleyn. It galls her. He should have pretended. He has made her queen. She has made him minister. But they are uneasy now, each of them vigilant, watching each other for some slip that will betray real feeling and so give advantage to the one or the other, as if only dissimulation will make them safe. But Anne is not good at hiding her feelings. She is the king's quicksilver darling, slipping and sliding from anger to laughter. Okay, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the form of this novel. So in general, when we think about perspective, there are three kind of key choices that you can make as a writer. You can decide to write in third person, which is kind of the fly on the wall, omniscient view. Uh, write in second person, where you address the reader directly and you use the word you, which is very unsettling and very rare, and we don't see it very often. And finally, first person, you know, where you use I, and it's through one person's consciousness very explicitly. With Bring Up the Bodies and Wolf Hall, we get a combination of third person and first, in a way. So it is third person, <coughs> but it's all directed through the consciousness of Cromwell. So instead of the fly being on the wall, if we imagine the fly is behind Cromwell's ear, all the time it's from his point of view. Um, so we've got a kind of sense of detachment in third person with the consciousness of first person. Um, and this has led to um, a lot of confusion about the text. That's why I've put Cromwell up here, as he said. Um, and when I spoke to Mantel, um, I was going to play you a section of the interview, but I don't think we've got time, actually. Um, when I spoke to her about it, she said, oh, yes, I did change it for Bring Up the Bodies. People complained so much about he said being ambiguous. I changed it for Bring Up the Bodies, and I put he Cromwell. And then people started to complain about that as well. Um, so I think you can learn from that that uh, your audience are never satisfied and you can't always please everybody. But that also there is a shift from Wolf Hall where he is making his name to bring up the bodies where he, he has made it. You know, he is now a right-hand man to the King of England. So he, Cromwell, that statement is different, it's important. So these are all choices that affect our reading of the text. There's also been an awful lot said about Mantell's use of the present tense. So this is a historical novel that's about the past, and yet it's told as if it's happening now. So again, this is a choice that she's making. The other interesting thing I think to consider in terms of this quotation is the way that she makes characters relate to each other. 
So um, Cromwell and Anne Boleyn are kind of oscillating around one another. They've made each other possible, but they're also in tension. Um, and to me, this seems to be um, saying something about narrative shape. When we talk about narrative, we often use shape metaphors. So we think of a narrative as linear, you know, having a beginning, a middle and an end. Or we think about narrative as circular, you know, coming back to the same place. Or even perhaps as elliptical, as not necessarily following the path that we expect. This is how I've decided to think about Bring Up the Bodies, as elliptical. Because an, an ellipsis is a, a particular kind of shape. I don't know if any of you have heard of um, the ellipse. Has, has anyone seen an ellipse? It's kind of like a squashed circle. A few people have, maybe. Um, when you draw um, an ellipse by hand, you have to put two centres in. And it seems to me that that's what Mantell is doing with this book all the time. She's sort of leaning towards Cromwell and then leaning back again towards Anne Boleyn. They both exist together within this elliptical narrative, if that makes sense. But each of them wants to kick the other one out and be the centre of the circle. Because we know history, we know that that person ultimately is going to be Cromwell, but we also then know that Cromwell himself will be executed. So you can't stay in the centre of the circle forever. This seems to be particularly important for reading the text. Um, okay, Mantel creates character through detail. So I've included some details up here. You know, we've always already talked about the he said. But also Henry VIII having a haircut. I thought that was absolutely hilarious. The idea that everybody had the same haircut just to make him feel all right about his haircut. <laughs> Um, these details reveal a lot about character and they throw a historical character into relief. So you might want to think about that in creating your own characters. Uh, Anne Boleyn is irritatingly always calling Cromwell Cromule with the French accent. Um, so these people become kind of characterised by a particular quirk or, or defect. Um, I've included Cardinal Wolsey and Thomas More as characters in this text. Um, they're dead but they're listed under the characters at the beginning, under the heading The Dead. And they're still haunting people. I mean, Thomas More in particular is haunting Cromwell, because Cromwell's played a huge part in his execution. Um, and then we've got the, the idea of the Austin Friars household, and I'll talk to you a bit more about that in the, in the uh, seminar. Um, okay. So what I'm going to do is move on to my final slide which is about the process of transplanting, which hopefully will be helpful to you as creative writers. So this is really a way of describing what Mantell does um, in terms of her writing. Um, and to give you an idea of that, I've actually included um, some information on the back of your seminar sheet, which is, if you turn your hand out over, you should be able to see that section on transplanting. Or at least you'll see that section in terms of the quotes from the, from the novel and then the analysis of it. Um, <clears throat> so what Mantel does is she takes a piece of um, historical fact um, and she transplants it into a fictional situation. So she, she is laborious in terms of her research. She spends years and years researching and she's very famous for having a kind of card index that's got every single day of every single year that she writes about. And she knows where every single character was on that day. So she never makes a mistake in terms of knowing where people were. You know, she doesn't say Cardinal Wolsey was meeting such a body unless they actually were. You know, she doesn't drop in a kind of casual reference to a character without knowing where they actually were. So she's very vigorous and very detailed. But she does do kind of creative transformation. So this uh, section of the novel where... Um, Cromwell gets home and he finds that his Austin Friars boys have made um, popes out of snow. I don't know if you've read this far into the book yet, but there's these popes made of snow. Um, and this is fictional, but it's based on something that actually uh, Mantell uncovered when she was researching for the novel. Um, and what she found was that this bloke somewhere had written to Cromwell and said, I've, I, made, I made a pope out of snow in my garden, and then I was worried that this might be kind of like sacrilegious, and I'm just writing to you to find out whether or not it is or not. Um, and Mantel was so taken by it as a kind of enzyme for her sort of creative writing that she thought, that's too good a kind of idea not to include. So what she did was she took the idea and she transplants it into the Austin Friars garden 
And she makes a point then about the Pope, about religion, about sacrilegion, and also about the Austin Friars household. So she uses it to her effect. Um, and this is the quotation where she kind of describes that. Um, it's, the, it's the second one on your sheet. She just says, um, this is in the Telegraph, it's reported. There is for Mantel a historian's sheer delight in uncovering a moment that has lain apparently unnoticed for almost 500 years. At Christmas 1535, members of Cromwell's household make snowmen figures of the Pope and his cardinals. Animatedly, Mantel describes a letter in existence to Cromwell from an individual otherwise unknown to history. The man writes how I made the Pope out of snow and the cardinals. It was for the better setting forth of the king's supremacy. This is a line that's directly lifted from here and put in the novel. And all the countryside around came to see it. Before he complains, the local priests and his cronies destroyed the snowman and accused him of heresy. The snowmen, Mantell says, are real, but I've transplanted them. So to me, this seems like a particularly uh, interesting way of thinking about appropriating history. You know, she's not just kind of rewriting the facts. She's sort of lifting them and grafting them into other places. And it seems quite visceral to me, this use of the word transplant, particularly considering this is a book that's all about bodies, you know, kind of actually physically taking something, confiscating it, so to speak, and putting it somewhere else. Um, this might be something that you want to emulate yourselves. We will talk a bit more about that in the seminars. Um, all I'd like to do now, really, is to just recap on what I've already told you. Um, I've talked to you about Hilary Mantel and her invisibility as a writer, critically, but also that she's induced national censure for writing about the assassination of Margaret Thatcher. I've also talked to you about the Tudor court, uh, its ambiguity, and how Mantel was strongly influenced by Thomas Wyatt's representation of the period. I've talked to you about character, particularly in terms of choice of perspective, how that can throw a character into relief, and focusing on a particular detail can make the character come to life. And finally, I've talked to you about transplanting um, and the notion of doing vigorous historical research and using that for your own writing. Um, I want to give the final word to Mantel and just read you the final section of Bring Up the Bodies, which just says, There are no endings. If you think so, you are deceived as to their nature. They are all beginnings. Here is one. Thank you. So I'll see you all in the seminar rooms at, uh, in about 15 minutes.